awesome to welcome Staz Ovidyanko to the Basketball Podcast. Staz is a prominent Ukrainian basketball figure who has made significant contributions to the sport as a player and a coach. Staz boasts an impressive 17-year career as a professional basketball player. During this time, he achieved significant milestones, including being crowned the champion of Ukraine and securing the Super League Cup. Transitioning from player to coach, Staz spent two years as an assistant coach before taking the reins as the head coach of BC Zaporizhia in the Ukrainian Super League. However, tragedy struck when the war reached his doorstep, quite literally. Despite his dedication to the sport, the conflict forced him to confront a new reality. Staz's journey exemplifies resilience, adaptability, and an unwavering commitment to basketball, even in the face of adversity, and I'm grateful to share it with you. Staz, welcome to the Basketball Podcast. Hello, Chris. Happy to be here and want to thank you again for the basketball immersion, everything what you did and still doing is like big stuff for the whole basketball world. Thank you, Chris. Well, I'm touched by that and uh, I'm grateful to have connected with you. I met Staz as a member of Basketball Immersion. His, a story, his story immediately resonated with me, as do so many stories of coaches in our community. But I do not share this as a political statement, but as a reminder of all the things that I'm grateful for, because life can take a shift pretty quickly. And I find personally, I operate better as a human being from a place of compassion and gratitude. So I wanted to share this story with you. And we're going to talk about basketball too and coaching and Stas rose to the highest level as a player and his highest level as a coach in Ukraine. And we'll talk about all those things. But Stas, maybe first, how has the ongoing conflict in Ukraine impacted you and your coaching career? It's it's tough, Chris, to be honest. It's tough to, to talk about it and even tough tougher uh, to be in Ukraine, to be a part of this unprovoked invasion when Russia invaded off Ukraine, and it's really hard. So we just right now we real, realize how happy we were before the war. Me, my wife, my family, my community, my team, before this war happened, and uh, obviously it affected everybody. It affected me because there I was the head coach of in a Super League in in Ukraine is a top level team. And as soon as it happened, uh, of course, the championship stopped. The basketball life stopped for, for the half of the year. My family, my wife and two daughters became refugees. They are in Germany right now because of this like hard, hot phase of war still. And because my, my own city, Zaporizhia, is like not far away from the front line. It's only like 30 kilometers. It's like, I believe, like 12, 15 miles away from the front line. And it's still dangerous because a lot of air bombings every day, a lot of like missiles and and it's hard. I don't want my kids to be in this, in that really, really dangerous situations. So explain to me. So your family's in Germany and you stayed. Why did you stay? Because I feel like Ukraine gave me a lot and I'm a big patriot of this country. And my as soon as I make made sure... Then my family is in a safe environment, safe country, safe situation. My first and the, the, the only one decision want to go to join army to protect my country. So as soon as they, my family left, I, I, got, I got to the army center and joined them. And I was there because of my education. I was the first lieutenant, lieutenant of the artillery. So I joined it. And uh, as soon as the our like learning, we can call it learning, ended. I got my unit and we just headed to the front line to, to protect my country. It's amazing and uh, true bravery on your part. And uh, like a true basketball coach, though, when you took a hiatus from coaching, but you immersed yourself in basketball immersion. <laughs> I'm not sure how those two things go together, but you're still holding on to that basketball part of you as you are part of this war. And Chris, uh, let me a little bit, I'm not a hero, really. Like if you would just describe that start of the war, it was really unprovoked invasion. Everybody was shocked. Nobody like really expected and couldn't still believe that this, this cruel war can happen in the 21st century. And all Ukrainians, like almost all Ukrainians were like joined all together with this like spirited, to give the spirited resistance. And we didn't like tell about ourselves oh we did something extraordinary we just what we had to do we had to protect our homes we have to protect 
our families, our our country, Ukraine, and like they feel like something really, really huge happening in, in the world. It's not the like area conflict. It's like huge between between the whole all like I think like the whole world is involved right now. And we feel like history in the making right now. And we, we couldn't stay on the side of it, couldn't run away of it. We have to take part and do whatever it takes to because it's takes a lot of a lot of energy and mental strength and everything else. And to be honest, for example, our our youth coach and referee from our academy, he also went to the front line and he died on the front line. It's uh, in the April of 2022. And Yuri Nemchenko and a lot of like basketball players and referees and coaches are still on the front line and fighting for our freedom. So and we're very sorry to hear that. Talk to us a little bit about, you've talked about the impact on you. You were a top level Ukrainian uh, pro league head coach, and now you're fighting. And talk to us a little bit more about the impact on the greater Ukrainian basketball community. Has basketball completely shut down in the whole country? I want to start it from the very, very first moment when it's, when the war started. It was like 5 a.m. And everybody, I mean, like, Everybody in the team was disoriented and didn't know what to do. And first of all, we we had uh, like we have that five foreign players. So we have American players, Canadian players, Lithuanian players, and we have to evacuate them quickly. So uh, to be honest, on that moment, we even care less about my own family. So we like they spent days and nights in a shelter in the basement and like we evacuated our players. So we, we, f- we felt that responsibility to, because we promised them that everything is going to be okay because of two months before the war started, it was a lot of warnings of from USA, from NATO about this forthcoming invasion of Ukraine. So, and we promised, we couldn't believe it still, like we promised every player that everything is going to be okay. We will take care of you. But some players broke their contracts, left the team on that moment. And it was really hard to evacuate them because because of and the traffic jam. It was like huge columns of cars taking their families away from Ukraine. And it was really hard to get. We need to cross like 1,000 plus kilometers to get them to Poland, to, to get players to, to the Poland. And then as soon as we get back to Zaporizhia, I start thinking about my family. And yeah, obviously basketball did shut down for the half of the year, like no practices and uh, a lot of gyms were destroyed. Youth players from Ukraine who was under, who were under 18, they became refugees also. They came out of the country also. And uh, I think still our next generation of Ukrainian players are still somewhere uh, in Europe, not in Ukraine. But then like, Life is going on. We can say it's like everybody adjust to this war situation. Somehow, federation keep on working, and it was right decision to to start new championship. Because if you would stop the basketball life, it, it would be hard, really hard to start it again from the from the zero. Because the and right now the championship is on. We have that system of bubbles, so far away from front line. Uh, we have that like six teams come together and play three days in a row, for example. By, by the Air Raider, is sounds Air Raider. Game is postponed. Everybody goes down to the basement with the bomb shelter and wait till it's over. And then come back to the gym to to keep playing again, to, to keep playing. And then this like pause can take like one hour and two hours sometimes. And it's like hard situation, but we couldn't complain because like players are still playing. A lot of people are involved still. And I, I feel like a huge part of basketball community really supported us. We felt like players who used to play with me like 15 years ago, like 20 years ago, they like found me and texted me, how are you and like, what you do you need? A lot of former players who are volunteering and sending us some some stuff, sending us like what we need. And we really feel, we, we really feel that support the basketball community worldwide. Like, Canada, USA, everywhere is like we have that supporters. So, so that 
attempt to return some normalcy to basketball for the youth in particular? I mean, obviously you outline the challenges and we can imagine the challenges are even deeper than that. For you personally, as a basketball coach, how are you trying to keep some normalcy in terms of, as I said, you rose as an incredible player and then you rose as a coach and now you have to take this break. What are some things that you're doing as a basketball coach to maintain some normalcy? Are you able to spend any time with basketball? To be honest, first half of the year, it was like impossible to focus and to think about basketball, to think about tomorrow, that everything is going to be okay tomorrow. It's, it was really hard. But, but but again, as I said, like we adjusted and I adjusted and sometimes we had the rotation from the front line. For example, we can spend like three days on the front line, then like get deeper into the country for a few days. And on those... I, and. We had, I couldn't say we have that days off in a war time, of course. We had that like moments off. And on those moments, I decided also to develop myself as a coach. So I, I like, I call it for me, being in the army, I said like, enlist myself to the basketball army. So I'm still in the army. I have to my duty. I have to watch. And I decided, decided to watch clinics daily one clinic per day if i can of course if i have like some opportunity and like or watch game of and during that last summer i watched march madness all games and all press conferences and i can say this like special kind of art listening to that press conferences to the american coaches is like it was amazing and and it and basketball really helped me mentally to believe in tomorrow to believe in life that everything is going to be okay again and everything will return and get even better. And I have to prepare myself to the for the tomorrow's better days. So you, you mentioned already when you were coaching, one of the main things was first to get the players to safety. Second is your family. You've talked about basketball during the war a little bit. Talk to us a little bit about you as a coach, you as a former high-level athlete. How have those skills helped you to be able to perform your best in the role that you're now in? It's all about leadership first, because as I said, I, I was the commander of my unit. It was artillery unit. So I had, it was moments when I had like 60 people under my commandment. So I have to take care about them. I have to, I was responsible, obviously, for their lives also. And I have to plan everything and I, I have to think technically and strategically and i have to be creative to to make to make a safe environment for them as it's possible in the war time and of course i understood that motivation is on on the front line is the almost the main thing because we were we were always always motivated because it's our country we have to protect it it's our decision to go to the front line to stop their russian invasion so, but the, when you exhaust it and when you are really tired and it's like day by day you exhaust it, it's really hard to keep that motivation. And But somehow I need to keep, grow this motivation from my people and for, for me personally, I always have to be my own example. I understand that without my own example, I couldn't like motivate my, motivate my people, my soldiers. And I, I talk to them a lot. Communication is the key to build that relationships, to build that trust, to build that motivation, to discuss everything with them. And it helped me and it helped them. And I think also the sense of humor, coaches sometimes use their sense of humor on the front line. It's also, it's impossible to be alive without sense of humor, especially, but when you want to cry, but you have to like, I couldn't say pretend, to be happy and pretend to be funny and like but uh, but sense of humor really helped us to to keep being motivated and to do our like army tasks also all of us almost all of us that are listening cannot in any way relate to this but certainly we show compassion for everything that you and everyone is going through and you know conflicts like this and political situations like this around the world affect people in so many different ways. And obviously in this example, we're focused on a basketball coach and to share kind of your story and your experience. And it's very humbling to hear all of this. And as coaches, we've often used war language in our 
examples, our analogies. We're going to battle. We got to win the battle. We've got to do all these things. And you mentioned humor. And I'm curious if you can reflect on some of these things that we kind of have said now and said, wow, it is not even close to the same. And we know that. We know that. But we, we've used these language. Do you think that language should still be used? Or should we think about different analogies to be able to spread kind of our examples? For me, I prefer to have different analogies right now. Because like, if I would hear like, you have to die on a court trying to steal it or whatever, just trying to win this game. I mean, like, I understand all these rules, where it comes from. But like, I, try, I will try to find different analogies for sure. But players in Ukraine... Also, they don't need to kind of be motivated right now. Everybody understand. Oh, it's a huge happiness, huge blessing to just keep the ball in their hands and being able to play, to compete, to have practices. Nothing can be compared with the normal basketball life. And it's a real blessing. I understand it right now. And we discuss, discuss it with my wife daily. So how this war affected on everyone. It's it's a great example you just shared about finding normalcy and, and, and happiness in certain things. And that example has been shared. I've read a lot of different types of biographies of people that have gone through similar situations. And they all point to the same similar thing that you need to find a purpose. You need to find a a purpose beyond just what you're facing now and see the kind of the future possibilities. For you personally, do you see the future possibility of you going back to being a head coach in the top league and then it helping to rebuild or take Ukrainian basketball to another level? Yeah, for sure. For sure. It's my goal. I feel like it's my dedication, my passion to be a coach. And I see how important right now to grow up kids and adults as a basketball players and grow up them with the with the right, correct sense of feeling that life, feeling of being patriotic, supporting their country, and also, and it's a huge mission on me. Also, I feel like they also discuss it in the army a lot about kids, about the system of our education, about what is going on on television, what is going on on social media right now, and how we can affect on positively effect on these kids who are looking at us and and thinking about their future in Ukraine. That's awesome to hear. And certainly we're very sensitive to what you're going through. And we understand, obviously, the incredible challenges of you even just joining us to do this podcast. We did want to talk about one topic specific kind of more to sport and basketball coaches, but obviously reflects what you're going through. And that's mental toughness. And again, something that coaches throw around all the time, this concept of mental toughness. Again, I am I know that you're embodying mental toughness beyond what you learned as a player and what you learned as a coach. But maybe share some of those thoughts that you have now from a player to a coach to someone who's in the army fighting a war. Mm-hmm. Talk to us about mental toughness. Okay. Of course, we all understand that game is a mental battle also. For example, to compare two players with the same skill set and with and without confidence, it's two different players. And we also had kind of kings practice, practice kings who were like performing so well on the practices, but couldn't uh, perform pretty solid during the games. It's it's everything is on the mental side also, and uh, we need to teach players to be be tough on the court to be like able to get over to to step over some difficult situations and as you chris said on the one clinic it was like mental toughness it's like determined pissed offness it's like determination if something ain't going well somehow we will find a way to uh, get out of the situation and uh, and we need to teach that to teach to discuss it with the players and uh, for example we can build our like culture, culture of our team. We can build on our core values. For values, for example, we can tell our team gonna be fast, tough, and we have to play together. And on those stuff, we can put in mental toughness also. Not only like we will the huge effort and we will play like hard defense. We can play mental toughness, and mental toughness for me is like also 
it's like controlling controlling emotions it's also like playing through fatigue and it's also given like solid nice response on the court response on the court you you mentioned it a little bit you know talking about different issues on the front line and i'm wondering about those conversations a little bit deeper do they parallel a little bit again in a very different way but do they parallel a little bit different i mean you and your staff sit together and you're discussing different things and you're problem solving and you're trying to come up with solution based coaching interventions is it very similar on the front line where you as a group or as an entity are are discussing these things from a solution based approach it's a good question and we discuss it a lot also because it's a more than war we need to be really creative we need to be really mobile we couldn't take part take part in this war actions reading like books 10 years ago and 20 years ago it's impossible because the war is evolving also using all those like starlings and drones and different stuff that can stop all those drones and it's like completely different war is going on right now not like 10 or like 50 years ago it's like completely different and we have to be creative and we discuss it uh, all my unit, uh, we hadn't had uh, some professional soldiers who like dedicated all their life to to serve in in the military. We all were like we had to. It was our decision to go to the army right now to protect. So we we, we had no chance to. We have no choice to not, to stay at home, for example. And we we our group was full of different people. We have like. IT scientists, we have builders, we have different, like even deputy was there. We have some drivers and like from different layers, I can say layers of the community. It was like poor and rich, educated and not it was like different. And yeah, we did discuss, we solved our problems daily that as, as for the team, we can make like breakdown of the game to discuss our mistakes. Also, we collected after some action to after action review if there is even like term for that a to discuss it what we have to do better what we need to do next time and it's on on a daily basis it's on a daily basis and it's it's a fascinating look inside so thank you for sharing that and with the mental toughness piece i know one of the things that you already referred to is is emotional control you are a human being on this planet. You're happy, you're sad, you're depressed, you're lonely, you're excited. You're all these emotions like every other human being. And you mentioned it a little bit about kind of masking things sometimes. Can you give us some, again, more insights in terms of coaching, in terms of applying some of those lessons? Because I think emotional control is one of those things that I think coaches at all levels struggle with, not just in terms of personally, but in terms of educating their players about how to be emotionally in control. That doesn't mean the absence of emotion, right? It means in being in control of emotions. Right, right. It's like 100% it affects on everybody. And I went through it when the commander of the unit is panicking, that each soldier will, will be in panic also. If, if you will, uh, if you confident, calm, and uh, know what, what are you doing right now, it's like all soldiers will trust on their commandment and act accordingly also. And for me, emotional control during the practices were really important also. We we had the technicals on the practice. So the player who got technical for not keeping their emotions, he got technical and he need to bring pizza for the next day for the whole team. Or sometimes we had that like money penalties it was not huge amount of money it's like a couple dollars but the the team cash register he collects that money and at the end of the season all team goes to the restaurant and on this money we like celebrate the end of the season and talking about emotions it's not about always about negative emotions it's always uh, about like reacting too high is also it can affect negatively on, on players' performance, so we're always talking about not too high, not too low, controlling it. And we used our, like, Q words or Q signs to get back players on their track, to make them refocus on the present moment, to tell them that something is going 
something is going bad with your attitude like approach right now so in few minutes you will be like explode with that negativity so obviously like body language yells and uh, it can tell us more than even players actions and we just that q word or q sign some like maybe exclam exclamation mark we made an exclamation mark we can show it to the player like think about it like try to listen to yourself try to control it and it really helped that keywords and you science did really help. Staz, you mentioned to me the phrase, talk to, your talk to yourself instead of listening to yourself. A phrase from the basketball podcast, episode 129 with Corey Close. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it's a cash phrase. It's like, it was really useful for me on the front line also for my soldiers. It was that approach when you're really tired, when like rain is falling on you and like you have to be here for the whole like three days in a row like for example you have lack of food and your body is tired and your body and mind like demands on getting out of here it's like really dangerous here uh, but we have our like task here to do so we always discuss talk to yourself and it really help talk to yourself instead of listening to yourself don't listen to your like tired body don't listen to your current situation you have your aim you have your motivation talk to yourself talk to yourself and it really helped it Corey close close the amazing job on that podcast it really helped me and somehow i was listening to that podcast like a few years ago but somehow it's like get back to my to my head and it really helped i'm curious are you sharing that kind of lesson or slogan with other people to be able to help them kind of cope with some of these things too yeah we discuss it we discuss it we share our as i said we have different uh, different people there different soldiers with their own big background with their own experience and age we have the 20 years and 60 years old and we're all united as a as a group and we discuss it a lot and i, I share it and we discuss it and it uh, really helped us to fight through fatigue, the same as basketball players can play through, through their fatigue to, to be consistent, to, to be able to perform on the highest level at the, uh, at the end of the games, uh, on the clutch time. And it, I think it's a very valuable phrase for everybody. I love it. And the other perspective that you obviously bring to us is what you just mentioned a few times. Different people, different places in life, professional soldiers, non-soldiers, people from different types of professions that normally wouldn't interact at all. And you all have to come together and be a team. So talk to mm -hmm. us about some of your perspectives on team building now. Maybe you came in with some views as a basketball coach, but now in this reality, maybe they've shifted some of your views or solidified some of your views. First of all, we need to talk to each other. We need to get to know everybody because I need to put each of the soldier on a proper space. He has to be the, mo the most valuable he can be. He has to be on that spot. Maybe a driver, maybe like some some soldier with the, with the drones or on a computer. It's like, and we have to know our, our soldiers and players, of course, obviously. We need to talk to them, communicate daily, build the trust together through this communication uh, and this approach the same as on a team we have to build it we have to take care about each other as the team united around the idea to get the victory we also on the, on the front line we all united with the idea uh, to win the war to stop the war to get back to our families to our homes alive uh, and that's why we didn't see we didn't see the ability to be not together we had to be together and you know and and it was so pleasant feeling when when we realized that ukrainian nation is united as have never been before we felt unity so we shared the last piece of bread we shared everything you need this you can take this one and it's like it's amazing feeling and understanding that it's bigger than me it's bigger than my like friend it's like the whole the whole the whole ukrainian nation 
stand up. It is amazing that any type of beauty could come from such a dire situation, isn't it? For sure, for sure. But uh, if we would uh, talk to each other, Chris, like a year ago, it would be completely different conversation. Because right now we adjust it, we realize what we have to do, where, where we can do our best and what we should do here. Because people can adjust for everything. Which is another parallel to coaching, right? To, to, to constantly tell your players that where we began is not where we end if we right, work right. At, towards a common purpose and common goal. That initially it might not be the best situation or we'll go through ups and downs, we'll go through struggles. That's all, all natural and normal. But where we were doesn't have to be where we end. Yeah, for sure, for sure. 100% right. Staz, unfortunately, again, your situation and other situations like yours in the world, I mean, where I sit here as a fellow human being, I go, why is this happening? And you mentioned in these modern times, why is this even happening? Why can't we sit down and figure things out without this? But we know the reality is unfortunately sometimes different. And I just personally can't th thank you enough for connecting with me, for building a relationship with me, and then for taking this time to be able to share with our audience. And uh, again, I think your example reflects many other examples of people that are going through real, real struggles and I just can't thank you enough for sharing with us. Thank you, Chris. And thank, I thank everybody from the basketball community worldwide. I just really help when you daily, you got messages. We need you. Stay safe. Try to be, try to do your best to don't risk too much. And it really helped when you got that messages daily, that support. It's, it's amazing. It's like motivates me from inside and. Again, when you exhaust it, it's easy to give up, really. But when you get that all that support, it's like it's impossible to give up. You, you will fight and then uh, keep going, keep going ahead. Well, our thoughts and supports to you and everyone else in the world that is going through struggles, and we cannot thank you enough, Stas. Stay safe, stay well, and we cannot wait for you to get back to coaching at the highest level in Ukraine and beyond. And we look forward to those days. Thank you, Chris. Thank you.